Welcome to the Civil War Center podcast. Learn about the battles, events, and people that shaped the turning point in American history. I'm your host, Andy Lucian. Today we are joined by Renette Chilton. Renette is the author of Lincoln's Great Coat, The Unlikely Odyssey of a Presidential Relic. Burnett worked for Brooks Brothers, who is the company that made Lincoln's great coat for his second inauguration and the coat he wore the night he was assassinated. This book has been meticulously researched with 144 images that tells the story of the great coat, its odyssey, and its emergence as a vivid reminder of the 16th president and his call to bind up wounds, care for others, and cherish a just and lasting peace. Today we will discuss the book and the journey of Lincoln's great coat. I hope you enjoy this discussion and learn something about the 16th president. So today we are joined by Renette Chilton. Renette wrote Lincoln's Great Coat, The Unlikely Odyssey of a Presidential Relic, which we will be discussing today. Renette, how are you today? I'm fine, doing well in a very rainy Northeast. (laughs) Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, Glad that you can still join us with the, the weather being bad outside. Hopefully this will make your day a little better, so. Thank you. So I want to talk about kind of your background, how you got interested in this. Obviously, like we were just discussing, Lincoln is a, there's a wealth of material on Lincoln, right? There's so many books, but this is, your book's different. Uh, It it doesn't necessarily focus on Lincoln, more uh, what Lincoln wore and what he wore was significant. So to, to start off, I want to know, how did you decide to write a book about Lincoln's great coat? What brought you into that subject? Well, I worked um, for 25 years for Brooks Brothers. And Brooks Brothers uh, is the oldest American retailer. And Brooks Brothers made the coat for Abraham Lincoln and his second, on, on the occasion of his second inauguration. So it was at Brooks Brothers during my tenure year, tenure there, that I became intrigued with the coat uh, and its journey. Brooks Brothers is very proud of its relationship with President Lincoln. It's closed uh, many successive U.S. presidents, including uh, President Obama. Uh, The clothier made the coat for President Obama's second inauguration. Uh, They clothe um, and have clothed in the past President Joe Biden. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, George Bush, a whole string of uh, presidents. So um, they've always been very, very proud of Abraham Lincoln. They have created several replicas of the coat. And throughout my tenure there, I would observe the clothier Brooks Brothers displaying the coat at various stores uh, throughout the country. I worked for the most part at its corporate office uh, right on 44th Street and Madison Avenue. I was a corporate trainer there for many, many years. So I traveled uh, throughout the country for them. But what really caught me uh, and caught the bug on this was that um, I started to wonder what happened to the coat after um, President Lincoln died uh, at Ford's Theater or the day after Ford's Theater on April 15th. Brooks Brothers made the coat for a second inauguration, March 4th, 1865. Apparently he really liked it and he wore it again to Ford's Theater on April 14th. And we all know what happened there. The coat returned to Ford's Theater in 1968. So that's 103 years. And I began to wonder when I was at Brooks Brothers, you know, what happened during those, what happened to the coat during those 103 years? Where did it go? Mm -hmm. Uh, Who got it? Was it in a museum? Where, where was it? So I, I thankfully, thankfully from Brooks Brothers, they allowed me to look through their archives. And one thing just led to another. As I say, I started to dig a hole so deep that I fell in. <laughs> and I thought the only way I'm going to get out is if I write a book about it. So I wrote the book about the coat and its odyssey. Very nice. Very nice. So have you- history been an interest of yours always in the Civil War? Or is it just, was it working there that kind of sparked that interest? Uh, history has always been an interest, but I, I should say really um, 
World War II history, the Gilded Age, and of course, I've always loved Abraham Lincoln. So I've read a lot of Lincoln. I had read a lot of Lincoln's books before um, I started to research the coat. Okay, but great. I didn't, I didn't major in history in college. Sometimes wish I did, um, <laughs> but um, it's always been a, fa a fascination of mine. That's the great thing about history. It welcomes everybody, whether they have a background from a scholarly background or you just study it, it welcomes everyone. So, right. and you mentioned that uh, the Brooks brothers uh, have this proud heritage. Do they, how do they display this pride in Lincoln? What, what is there things in the company? Are there things they do for the public? Like what is their connection there? Well, when I was there, um, they would display a replica of the great coat usually around his birthday in February. And in fact, in my book, I have a picture of the coat on display at its flagship store on Madison Avenue. Also, uh, in looking through the archives, I've discovered that as far back as 1965, which was the 100th, um, I don't want to call it anniversary, but uh, 100 years since his death, uh, it took out an ad in the New York Times and other prominent newspapers in which it talked about Abraham Lincoln and making the coat for his second inauguration. And do they sell these replicas or is the replicas just for display? No, they don't sell, sell them. Um, they're just for display. They donated one to the National Park Service in 1990. And that replica right now you can see at Ford's Theater. And also Brooks Brothers in the past has loaned the garment to various, um, uh, pardon me, various uh, libraries throughout the country, presidential libraries. I know that the Reagan library had it on display for a brief period and that's the replica. And also Hildeen, which was the um, home of Robert Lincoln. I believe that Hildeen up there in Manchester uh, Vermont had it on display at one time as well. So, and then the store, the various stores uh, do display it. I know it's been on display in Boston. Washington, D.C. is a big one. It's been there. And the New York stores. I'm sure there's some Lincoln impersonators who'd love to get their hands on one of those. So that's why I had to ask. Yeah. yeah so sure. you, you mentioned writing this, you dug into the archives at the Brooks Brothers. So what what totally went into writing this book? What, what was the process? What kind of research did you have to do? How long did it take? Well, it took me a few years, like about seven or eight. Keep in mind, oh. I was working full time. So I call this a labor of love, but it took a lot of research. I went through the Brooks Brothers archives. They're part of the uh, history factory located in Virginia right outside of Washington, DC. I made a couple trips there to the history archives. And then as I would find other documents, as most researchers know and historians know, one document will lead to another document. So of course I spent some time at the Smithsonian um, Institution. I worked with their archives uh, department. I was at the Library of Congress quite a bit and I did spend a lot of time at Ford's Theater uh, behind the scenes working with the um, park rangers. They supplied me with quite a bit of documentation. The Chicago Historical Society uh, was very generous with their time as well. The um, and various um, other uh, record groups throughout the country. Wow, so, so very intensive and a few of the other authors I've talked to uh, recently, we talked to Dr. Jonathan White. He wrote two books on Lincoln. He kind of had a similar thing. Takes years, lots of uh, primary source archives are digging yes. through. So, why the books, the Brooks Brothers? Why did Lincoln get his great coat from them? Was there a significance there that he chose them? Uh, no, Brooks Brothers was um, a well-respected uh, clothier at the time in the 1860s. The shop opened in 1818. Uh, in Lower Manhattan on Catherine and Cherry Streets. Business was great. And uh, in the 1850s, um, Brooks Brothers opened another shop on uh, Broadway and Grand Street. It was a very, very beautiful building. And they catered to, you know, the elite of society back then. 
Unfortunately, um, as recently, it's recently been discovered, they also sold clothes to uh, plantation owners who in turn clothed their enslaved um, folks who lived, who clothed, clothed the enslaved with uh, livery jackets, et cetera. And that's a very sad part of the history that I hope that Brooks Brothers will, you know, eventually own up to. But by Lincoln's time, uh, Brooks Brothers had clothed captains of industry, veterans. They made uh, uniforms for the Army and for the Navy. In the Civil War, they clothed uh, Generals uh, Sherman and Hooker and Sheridan. And they even made clothing for General Grant and eventually President Grant. Now, Lincoln, I just want to add something here. Lincoln was really not into going to stores, and we have no record that he ever shopped at Brooks Brothers. In fact, as president, um, he never returned to New York City, except for once when he quietly passed through the city on his way to West Point. So there is no record of him visiting a Brooks Brothers store. But what Brooks Brothers has in its archives is a letter that they wrote to Mary Lincoln in October of 1863, offering to go to the executive mansion, which is what the White House was called, and mm -hmm. take the quote, measure of his excellency, the president for clothing. <laughs> That's very cool. And so more than likely, um, the clothier would have sent someone to the executive mansion to not only fit the president, but to deliver the clothing as well. And this was designed specifically for his second inauguration? Yes, and we don't know whether he ordered it, whether his wife ordered it, which, which a lot of historians will tell you that Mary Lincoln was the one who did all of the shopping. And in fact, that letter in the Brooks Brothers archives is addressed to Mary Lincoln. But we don't know if a politician had it made for him or if Brooks Brothers gifted it to him. But what made the coat very unique was its lining. It was a quilted lining with uh, an image of a eagle in flight bearing the declaration, one country, one destiny. It was a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And what was the significance behind that? Was that targeted at trying to reunify the country? Oh, I think so. 1865, we were hopefully nearing the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, it used the phrase that Daniel Webster had used in 1837, one country, one destiny. And I think even though it was very applicable in 1865, I think it's an enduring message mm -hmm. that and, brings you today. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that Lincoln wears this at a second inaugural address. He also wears it at Ford's Theater. Were these the only two occasions he wears this coat on? Well, he could have worn it uh, between that time as well. We don't know if he took it with him to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we have no evidence. Things sometimes pop up, maybe eventually. But we do know that he wore it or took it along with him to Ford's Theater. Henry Rathbone, who was one of the guests in the presidential box, later gave an affidavit. And he said the president for the, for the entire performance before Wilkes Booth crept in the, into the presidential box that President Lincoln sat in his, in his rocker except for once. And he said on the purpose of standing to put on his overcoat. And that was the Brooks Brothers great coat. Yeah, two pretty uh, significant moments there to have that coat on. So, mm -hmm. so Lincoln wears it to Ford's Theater. Obviously he's assassinated that night. Uh, we won't get too much in the details here, but uh, tragically he shot. And what happens to the coat then? I mean, they take the president out of Fort Cedar. They take him across the street. Uh, he's taken into an empty guest room and obviously he's there for a few hours before he passes away. So what happens to his coat after this? Well, the coat, first of all, Dr. Leal cuts the coat. He orders a gentleman in the state box. Dr. Leal is the first um, physician to reach the state box. And he orders... President Lincoln, and he has him uh, on the floor, and he orders that his coat be cut from the neck to the elbow. So they took the coat off sometime in uh, while the president was being attended to in the state box. 
it's brought over to Ford's Theater. Uh, pardon me, it's brought over to the Peterson House. It stays there after the president leaves. Willie Clark, he's a young man who works, uh, he's a clerk in one of the government offices. He returns to his rented room. It was his room in which President Lincoln died. And he hides the clothing from the uh, relic hunters who ascend uh, the Peterson house looking for a cherished relic. He hides the clothing and he also hides the president's boots and he returns the clothing to Robert Lincoln. He does keep the boots. They eventually work their way back to the Lincoln Museum in 1947. That's a different story, but the clothing gets returned to, to Robert Lincoln, who is still at the uh, executive mansion with his mother for about a month. So in the immediate aftermath, uh, the stuff goes back to Lincoln. And, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it goes back to the Lincoln family. And then from there, where does this coat get shipped well, to? Mary Lincoln decides that she's going to give the clothing, which is the great coat, which is the Brooks Brothers great coat, and the black suit to a faithful doorkeeper at the executive mansion, whose name is Alfonso Don. However, she writes him a letter, and this has a lot to do with the provenance of the um, clothing. She writes him a letter a few days before she departs from the executive mansion for good. And this is in May of 1865. And she tells him by letter that he, can, he may have the coats, have the clothing, but she's first going to loan it to an artist called Matthew Wilson. And the clothing gets loaned to Matthew Wilson. Apparently, um, Mary Lincoln was very pleased with a painting that Matthew, Wilf Matthew Wilson made of her husband, it was a, it's a last lifelike portrait of President Lincoln, which Wilson signed right in April. And apparently she was interested in having a full length portrait made of her husband. He never, he never did one, there's no record of that. He keeps the clothing for about two years. While he's holding onto the clothing, a young woman named Vinnie Ream, she's a sculptor, she, she wins a prize commission to sculpt a statue of President Lincoln, and she asked to borrow the clothing. And there's a big brouhaha, and that we could we could spend the whole uh, time just on that. But there was so much objection to having her even sculpt the um, late president. And Mary Lincoln objected to it. Uh, there were senators, and what was the objection there? Uh, well, that she was young. Uh, they called her a pretty woman, and her sex, a pretty woman of winning ways. They didn't feel that she had the experience to sculpt such a monumental task. And Mary Lincoln writes to Alfonso Don, and she says, you've got to claim the clothes and claim them quickly. And then she says, burn this letter and share contents with no one. Well, Alfonso Don didn't burn the letter. He kept it. And that was part of the uh, supporting documentation. Vinnie Ream goes on to sculpt this beautiful statue of Abraham Lincoln, which today stands in the Capitol Rotunda. And it was unveiled in 1871. And so sometime after that, the clothing finally gets to the doorkeeper, Alfonso Don. And why did Mary Lincoln choose Don to give the great coat to? Why was he their choice? Good question. In her letter, she write one of the letters that she writes to him, and we have three letters on file. Uh, she says, for your devoted attentions, attentions to President Lincoln, I gave you those clothes. And then she asks him something, which he did honor for the rest of his life. Retain them always in memory of the best and noblest man who ever lived. Wow. He, he didn't know the Lincolns very long. Alfonso Don was a police officer with the Metropolitan Police. He met the Lincolns right before Lincoln's second election in November of 1864. He was ordered to report to the executive mansion. He was assigned to guard the president. He only did that for about two months. And in January, he assumed the position as a doorkeeper. He stayed there until just a few mo months before he died in the 1880s. He stayed through successive uh, presidential uh, terms. 
he was especially kind to the Lincoln's fourth and youngest son, Tad. And I think that that might have endeared him to the Lincolns. On the very night that President Lincoln was at Ford's Theater, Alfonso Don was with uh, Tad Lincoln at Grover's Theater. And it was there that the house manager announced the president had been shot and Don takes Tad home or Taddy as they called him back to the executive mansion and stayed with him and comforted him. And that may have endeared him to uh, Mrs. Lincoln in particular. Mm -hmm. So Don gets the coat. Uh, he holds on to it throughout his lifetime. He serves throughout various presidents. Then what happens to it when he passes away? Where does this great coat go to next? Well, that's a great question. He leaves it to his son, Frank, and daughter-in-law. And throughout the rest of the 19th century, the clothes pretty much rest quietly with them. It's the turn of the century. And, it get, and as, t as things get closer to the centennial of Lincoln's birth in 1909, that Frank and Catherine Don realize that they have something of historical historic value. Lincoln, as you know, through uh, the longer we got from the Civil War, Lincoln was emerging as the savior of the Union. Um, the, Lincoln com the Lincoln Memorial Commission was formed. There were great tributes made during, his, um, during the centennial of his birth. And equally important, Frank Don did not have the sentimental uh, um, attraction to the coat that his father had. He realized that it had that it had something of historical significance. So he set out to place the clothing in a museum or with a historical society. However, um, he died in 1915 and it didn't get very far. They did try shortly before his death uh, to place the clothing with the Lincoln Memorial Commission for eventual eventual display in the Lincoln Memorial, which didn't which wasn't dedicated until 1922, but that bill failed in committee. Frank Don dies. We go through the Great War, and then the coat emerges again in the 1920s for sale. <laughs> Was it, did they know it was Lincoln's coat or was it just kind of like it popped up for sale? Oh no, they knew it was, they knew it was Lincoln's coat. And this is what happened in the 1920s, early 1920s, Frank Don's widow, her name was Catherine. She enlists the help of an attorney and they contact the National Museum, which is the Smithsonian. And they have a novel offer. They're, they're looking to donate you want to call it donate the clothing to the National Museum if a patron would underwrite the purchase for Mrs. Don. Mrs. Don was widowed. She had two children and she was in need of funds. So Mrs. Don, Catherine Don, and her attorney, who represented her for no fee, they met with the curator of the National Museum. And he was very impressed with the with the clothing. He was very impressed with the letters from Mrs. Lincoln. There was also a letter from Robert Lincoln, which um, was a, uh, pardon me, a recommendation for Alfonso Don. He was very impressed. And he said, this is great. Basically, let's, let's look for a patron. But there's one person we need to contact just to verify the authenticity of the collection. And who's that person? It's the early 1920s. I like to ask people this, but it's none other than Robert Lincoln. Robert Todd Lincoln had a home in the Georgetown section of Washington, DC. So they wrote him a letter and they asked if he would verify the collection and he didn't respond. And they <laughs> waited and they waited and they waited. And after almost a year, they decided that they would contact him again and they would give a, a new approach. And that was that the assistant secretary, the secretary of the Smithsonian himself would call upon Robert Lincoln personally. So they sent out that letter and he responded within just a matter of days. And in short, what he said was, I have no doubt that the um, clothing is genuine. 
However, he made a very unusual request. He said, I wish that the clothing would be put away here and after and stay basically secluded and not be put for sale. And what he was basically saying was hide the clothing. It's real, but hide it. So this gave the Smithsonian, this was a dilemma. They, they looked over his letter. I read through uh, internal memoranda that went back and forth and they still were interested in getting the clothing if a patron would come forward and pay you know, Mrs. Don for the clothing. But they were in a dilemma. They, they wrote in their memoranda that they said, Robert Lincoln doesn't want this displayed. So what are we gonna do? Well, they didn't have to worry about it too much because no patron came forward. I mean, back then, I think news traveled among their social circles rather quickly. And I don't think anyone wanted to buy, come forward and to purchase the clothing, knowing that Robert Lincoln did not want it to display in the National Museum. And why did he not want it displayed? Well, we don't know. He didn't give a reason. What I speculate in my book was perhaps he didn't want uh, another embarrassing a debacle about the old clothes scandal. In 1867, Mary Lincoln tried to sell some of her clothing at a pawn shop in New York City. And the, once the press learned of her intentions, they pounced on uh, her desire with scathing critiques. They mm -hmm. called her the unhappy lady. They mocked the condition of her clothing. Uh, this was carried throughout the country. And it was very embarrassing, I'm sure, for Robert Lincoln, who seldomly talked about his family, at least publicly. And perhaps he didn't want to go through another embarrassing uh, moment with um, this. We're not sure. We're mm. not sure. Maybe he just didn't want this clothing on display and folks would come and criticize it. Who knows? He just wanted it put out of the way. So Robert Lincoln wants it hidden. We get to the 20s. The Smithsonian is unable to purchase it. The Don family still has it. Where does this great coat end up next? Well, Catherine Don still needs the money. They tried the Lincoln Memorial. They tried the Smithsonian. And so their next step is an auction. But before they put it up for auction, they contact Brooks Brothers. And this is in 1924. And Brooks Brothers, by that time, they knew of the great coat. They were very proud of creating the great coat but they didn't know that it still existed. And in January of 1924, they were enlightened to the fact that the great coat still existed. And the Don family offered to sell the coat to Brooks Brothers and they replied by telegram. They were very much interested, but the price was too high. The Don family wanted over $20,000. So Brooks Brothers sends in a matter of two days, Brooks Brothers replies with a, with a telegram with just two words, not interested. <laughs> and that was the end of that. So then the Don family, that now they're really running out of all sorts of options and they decide to put the clothing up for sale at an auction house in Philadelphia, Stan Henkel's auction house. He was a renowned auction merchant. It was a great choice. It goes on uh, auction in February of 1924. They get a lot of publicity. The papers talk about it. Um, there were letters that were sent to Brooks Brothers referring to the papers advertising the coat of the immortal Abraham Lincoln will be on sale. It will be hawked to the highest bidder. There were some newspapers that even criticized it. Um, and in fact, um, one man wrote a letter and he said, if Abraham Lincoln knew of this auction, he would rise from the dead and strike the very idea from, from, <laughs> the, from the brain of the people who thought about selling it. And so it had a lot of mixed reactions, but nevertheless, it went for auction. Now, the Don family wanted to realize more than $20,000. They didn't get very far. They got 6500 mm -hmm. But here's the mystery. The man who bought that coat said his name was Mr. Douglas. And the newspapers wanted to know more about this mysterious buyer, but no one would give out any information about him. Not even the auctioneer. He said it would be unethical for me to talk about this. And so the press got a little curious. 
they wrote clothes go to Lincoln's clothes go to a quote, Mr. Douglas close quote for 6,500. Others mocked the paltry sum that went to this mysterious gentleman. Who was he, they asked. And I believe that they would have revealed his mystery, but suddenly there was something brewing from Chicago, the land of Lincoln, Illinois. The Chicago Historical Society immediately, within a day of the auction said, hold up, hold up, Philadelphia. We have the coat Lincoln wore, you don't. And they accused the Don family and the auctioneer, auctioneer in Philadelphia of engaging in crooked work. And so who had the real coat then? Well, that wasn't solved for another 25 years. Um, the Chicago Society emerged as the uncontested winner of the coat. No one would challenge the provenance of the provenance, pardon me, of the coat that the Chicago Historical Society was displaying. A wealthy benefactor, his name was Frank Logan, he purchased a frock coat, not an overcoat, but a frock coat from um, two White House employees in the 1890s. He put the coat on display for many years and he eventually donated it to the Chicago Historical Society a few days before the auction. And I believe the Chicago Historical Society was not going to cross its wealthy benefactor. And they went with Frank Logan's word that indeed that was the coat. They had the coat that President Lincoln wore to Ford's theater. There was a lot of confusion. Um, Brooks Brothers tried to get it settled through the years. They wrote to the Chicago Historical Society. They said, does a coat have an emblem? Does it have a design? Is there a motto in the coat? And they would never get any answers. The daughter of Catherine Don, she died, wrote to the Chicago Society, uh, Society, Historical Society in the 1930s. And she said, I'd like to absolve my mother of, of the label of crooked work. She, she went to her death thinking that she was involved in some kind of crooked activity. And I'd like you to look at the clothing and the uh, correspondence. And they, they wrote her a nice letter, but they said, basically, we're not interested in your item. So the coat, the Don collection rested under a shadow of suspicion for about 25 years. The Don family, by this time, it's Alfonso Don's granddaughter, Catherine. She has it in a lockbox in a bank somewhere outside of the DC area. And the Lincoln coat stays on display at the Chicago Historical Society. And it fascinates visitors. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote about it in her My Day column. Various journalists spoke of the coat that Lincoln uh, wore when he met his untimely demise. And it went on for 25 years until 1949. And then, shall I continue and tell you what happened? Yes, and please. And then do. in 1949, <laughs> the director of the Chicago Historical Society, his name was Paul Angel, a well-known, renowned Lincoln scholar, examined the evidence again. He had seen the evidence in the 1930s when he was the director of the Lincoln Centennial Association, which later became the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Association, which exists today. However, he got to see the evidence again, and he examined the affidavits. There were affidavits there from Brooks Brothers attesting to the genuineness, uh, the, the, uh, to the coat. There were letters from Mary Lincoln. He looked at the clothing again, and he finally, decided, yes, the Don family has the clothing. So what he did was he wrote an internal memo in 1949, in which he said um, the clothing uh, that the Chicago Historical Society is not genuine. And he removed it. He said, I have this day removed from exhibit the Lincoln frock coat on display at the Chicago Historical Society. He later told a fam a a newspaper reporter in the early 1950s that he said, I concluded the coat was a phony and quietly hid it away. So that was a great uh, day for the Don family, but they didn't find out about it until the 1950s. 
um, when Guy Allison, who was a syndicated columnist, contacted Dorothy Don Smith. She's now the granddaughter of Alfonso Don and told her about it. And I'm, I'm sure she was very relieved, not only to have um, the, its authenticity established, but I think her mother was finally absolved from the unjust accusation of crooked work. So all the while, the real overcoat is just sitting, basically tucked away from the time Lincoln is killed till we get to the 50s, 60s. Yes, and you know where it's tucked away? In a bank vault, vault and in paper bags. They stored it in paper bags. <laughs> I always so, wonder, was it Piggly Wiggly or was it A&P? They were just grocery bags. Wow. Yeah, a, 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 in a bank, in a large, extra large um uh, safety deposit, safe deposit box. So when they verify that this is the real code, I'm sure people now want it on display. So what happens to the code at this point? Well, they try uh, to sell it a few times. And this is the 1950s, the 1960s. Uh, they made a few more attempts to sell it to the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian, again, wasn't interested. And I feel that they were honoring Robert Todd Lincoln's request because when I look through internal mem memoranda there, they would always refer to Robert Todd Lincoln, even in the 1960s. You know, he had been dead since 1926, but his request was that it be put away, uh, you know, hidden away. And I also think that the Smithsonian um, didn't want it because, uh, one of the reasons why they rejected it was uh, in the 19, 1964, one of their rejections, it was just months after John F. Kennedy's untimely death. And I don't think they wanted anything connected with assassination at that time. Mm -hmm. The Don family dropped the price even in 1964 to 15,000. That's as low as they went. They went anywhere from 100,000 to 50,000 to 20,000 and their their lowest price was 15,000 in 1964. And the Smithsonian at that, that point just wasn't interested. It wasn't the time uh, after JFK's death uh, to pursue anything that had to do with assassination. Mm -hmm. So Dorothy Don, she's getting up there in age. Uh, she's the granddaughter. Uh, her husband uh, passes away uh, in the early 19, uh, in early 1967. It looks like the clothing is just going to pass on to their grandchildren. You know, they had tried the uh, Lincoln Memorial. They had tried the Smithsonian several times. It had gone up for auction. Uh, they had even tried Brooks Brothers twice and it was rejected. Um, so I, I think they just pretty much would have forgotten about it, except after Dorothy Don Smith's husband passed away, she met with her, her husband's estate attorney uh, in the, at the Wachovia Bank in downtown Greensboro, North Carolina, which is where Dorothy Smith was living. And they go inside the bank vault and she points to this lockbox. And she happens to say to her attorney, <clears throat> to her husband's estate attorney, to, uh, to her husband's estate attorney. Oh, by the way, I have Lincoln's assassination clothes in here. And I interviewed the estate attorney shortly before he passed away. And he said, I thought she was off her rocker. <laughs> I said, let me see this. And he says, out, she opens it up and there are paper grocery bags and out comes this clothing, this beautiful um, great coat and this black suit. And then she has these original letters from Mary Lincoln and from Robert Lincoln. And he basically says to her, hey, you've got something here. Maybe we can do something. And I don't know that he said she was reluctant at first, but she said, you know, go ahead, go, go and try one more time. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He goes back to the Smithsonian and this is in 1967. Again, they reject it, but this time they give him um, some great information and a great lead. Ford's Theater is is uh, is getting Ford's Theater is going to reopen in 1968 as a living memorial to President Lincoln and his love of the theater. The the Ford's Theater had been closed since 1865. 
it was an office building and there are other stories that went on there. And they did house the Lincoln Museum on the first floor, but they were going to reopen and they had planned to open it in February of uh, 1968. And the curator of the Smithsonian basically said, hey, go for it, contact the um, Fred Schwengel, who is a um, congressman from Ohio, Ohio. He was he was behind one of the efforts of the restoration. He was the chair of the Capitol Historical Society. So he had some good leads. However, they wanted $50,000. And after speaking with Congressman Schwengel, he said, look, I don't think I can get a congressional appropriation for $50,000. Mm-hmm. So they contact Brooks Brothers again, third time. And they say, hey, they were asking, he, the attorney says basically, well, the asking price is 50K, <clears throat> but 35 or 40,000, we think we can do it for that. They get a reply back from the great, great grandson of the founder of Brooks Brothers, who was still on staff there. And he said, the asking price is way out of line, forget about it. <laughs> and, he said, and he says, it's a shame. He says, this should go to some museum, et cetera. So Brooks Brothers, with Brooks Brothers out of the picture, with a congressional appropriation unlikely, what do they do? They take out an ad in the New York Times and they say, for sale, Lincoln assassination clothing, buyers only. And that sparked a lot of interest. So they tried, that was in April of, of 1967. And their goal was to get the clothing to the Ford's Theater by February of, or pardon me, by the end of January of 1968. So uh, Congressman Fred Schwengel stepped up and said, I'm gonna help you. We're gonna try to get a donation. And he tried, but he was batting zero. He even went to Hollywood. Hollywood said no. And it looked like again, it could. they just couldn't believe it. It looked like again, this clothing would fail in its final bid to go to its ultimate resting place. It, it, it became, it became you know, we went through summer, we went through fall, they, there wasn't anybody biting at it. So Dorothy Dawn Smith, who's quite elderly, she says, look, I'll tell you what, I'll loan the clothing to Ford's Theater so they can have it when they open up. Um, and they had a lot of gala events and they were very pleased that there was going to be a loan of the garments. But her attorney said, look, she'll loan it to you, but she still needs to sell it. And they said, okay, okay. It just didn't look good. But just a few days before the rededication of the theater, Congressman Fred Schwengel, who had tried unsuccessfully to get that clothing purchased, he went here, there, and everywhere. He has to attend an annual meeting of the American Trucking's Trucking's trucking associations has nothing to do with Lincoln and nothing to do with his quest. But as a congressman, he sat on various committees and he had to go to a lot of luncheons. He goes to this luncheon and he sits next to the secretary of the association. He doesn't even know this guy. He starts talking to him and their light conversation soon turns to Schwengel's quest to get the relics placed in Ford's theater. Well, this guy, who was the secretary of the uh, trucking associations, was so impressed. He said, look, if they'll take it for $25,000, i will have a check in your hand in a matter of days. Schwengel goes back to Dorothy Dawn's attorney, tells him the good news. She takes it. And just one day after the dedication of the Ford's theater and the new and the Lincoln Museum, the clothing returned to um, Ford's theater. Uh, the American Trucking Associations uh, donated the clothing to the Capitol Historical Society and the Capitol Historical Society turned it over to the Department of the Interior. Wow. And, and there it returned. Yeah, just by a chance meeting. And After it's, all that time. It's very surprising that no one would in all that time want to pick up uh, like a hundred years would want to pick up a piece of history like that, but that's incredible. So, so it makes its way back to Ford's theater. Finally, yes. is that where it stays then until the present day? Yeah, it's, it's there. Uh, it, it was removed from permanent display in 2011. 
It's in storage now. It emerged twice in 2015 on the occasion of President Lincoln's 150th remembrance of his birth. They had it on display there uh, right outside in a building across the street from Ford's Theater in an ex exhibition called Silent Witnesses. And it's currently on display now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's there until uh, September 5th of this year. And it's part of the exhibit in America, an anthology of fashion. Now, the reason why it was taken off of display in 2011 was that the lining, the intricate lining was deteriorating. And it went through a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of attention, a lot of care all those years. When it first went on display, uh, Forest Theater wasn't climate controlled. It was exposed to lighting, humidity, temperature fluctuations, even they said people's breath. And it wasn't in, the, in, in a proper case. Mm. But through time, as time emerged, preservationists tried to save the garment, the beautiful lining, but they felt that it was deteriorating at a rapid rate. So it was removed from permanent display in 2011. They now display the beautiful great coat that uh, the replica that Brooks Brothers donated in 1990. But you have a rare chance to see it now in 2022 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. They display the coat closed. They don't show the beautiful lining, but they have some pictures of it. And of course, they're selling my book there, which is very nice of them in their shop, uh, which tells the story in detail. I have a lot of pictures in my book about the lining, and I go into great detail about the coat and its deterioration. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to have to try to make a trip out there to see that because yeah. it, it seems like a very rare thing these days. And researching this, I saw that they had it on display in 2015. I didn't know it was on display again. So his great coat has nearly as interesting of a story as Lincoln himself. Am I correct in that? I think so. Yes, indeed. And, and this is an aspect of Lincoln, obviously, can, taking this back to the beginning, we talked about the wealth of Lincoln material out there. This is something that stands kind of alone, correct? It does. It's, it's an untold story. Uh, my book right now is the only one out there about it. Um, and it gave, I had a great perspective working at Brooks Brothers. So I had great access to the archives my research is really uh, primary source material. Mm -hmm. And um, I have about 150 images in there. And it really is, as one textile preservationist called it, a seminal part of the American story. It weaves in and out for 150 you know, years now. Um, but the coat endures, and I think its message, one country, one destiny is very timely, and it's an enduring message. You know, he wore it during a time of great civil uh, strife, a terrible time in our, our country. And we were healing. We were hopeful uh, when he gave his address in um, 1864. And during that time, 1865, I'm sorry, 1865, he talked about healing and he talked about caring for others, caring for the widow and for the orphan and, you know, working toward a peace among ourselves and with all nations. And I think that Great Coat tells a great story. It's a symbol of that, of mm. his kindness. I like to think of it more as a symbol of that event rather than an assassination relic. Mm -hmm. So uh, this sounds like a fantastic book, great research and a wealth of knowledge in there. Uh, is there ways that if listeners have questions or uh, would like to purchase the book, are there ways they could contact you, places they can pick up a copy of this book? Sure. May I, may I show you the book? Hold it up. Yeah, yes. go for it. I'd love to see it. Here it is here. Uh, Lincoln's Great Coat. And um, if you can see here, it's a, a lining here. It's called uh, The Unlikely Odyssey of a Presidential Relic. And um, the publisher is McFarlane. Now, the book is considered a textbook, so it's a little pricey. It is offered at on the McFarlane website. It's also offered on Amazon. If you're in New York City at the Met, the Met shop is selling it currently. But I also tell people just to ask, go to your local library and ask the librarian to uh, order it for you. And they'll order it and put it in their, um, their book collection. 
It's called Lincoln's Great Coat, The Unlikely Odyssey of a Presidential Relic. You're also welcome to contact me. I have a LinkedIn page. I have a <clears throat> Facebook page called Lincoln's Great Coat. And I put a lot of tidbits and a lot of pictures and images from the book. I post that online. I've got quite a uh, following under that Lincoln's Great Coat. I'm also on Twitter, Renette C. I post a lot of uh, pictures and images as well. I am working on a second edition. Hopefully my publisher will um, accept it. And I hope to have it out by 2026 because I am hopeful that for uh, the 250th birthday of our country, that the coat will again be on display because it is a part of its valuable Americana and it's a part of our, our national heritage. Yeah, it sounds like it's a piece of Lincoln history, but it's also a piece of American history. It was there through World Wars, Vietnam War, the 60s. I mean, it touches on every American era. So it sounds like it's definitely yes, it representative does. of our it story. Does. It does. And I'll just tell you one piece of uh, a little something of irony. I grew up in a time where um, there was a lot of comparisons to JFK and Lincoln. You know, Lincoln's uh, vice president was Mr. Johnson. Uh, Kennedy's vice president, his surname was Johnson. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but some yeah. of your listeners who are about my age will remember this. But here's something very interesting. And I note this in the second edition of my book. Um, when the clothing was unveiled at Ford's Theater in 1967, and I'll just show you a, a picture of it. I can show you. This is a, a picture of the clothing being unveiled uh, at Ford's Theater. And this ha this happens to be Fred Schwengel, uh, the congressman who was very instrumental in getting the clothing. The photographer, uh, Cecil Stoughton, uh, took this unveiling picture. And this wasn't his only link to assassination clothing. He was also the chief still photographer during the Kennedy administration. And he took that iconic photo of Lyndon Johnson taking the oath of office aboard Air Force One with Jackie Kennedy standing next to him in her, um, she's wearing her pillbox hat. So that's quite a connection. Um, you know, the same photographer for both Kennedy, uh, for Kennedy and then also took uh, Lincoln's clothing, uh, the unveiling of his clothing in 1967. Yeah. You know, uh, strange coincidences. Definitely, yeah. Is, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, um, I wrote the book uh, for really just anyone, um, whether you're an established Lincoln historian or you have an interest in uh, Lincoln history. I go quite a bit into the assassination. I call it that fateful night. There's quite a bit of history on uh, Brooks Brothers. I call it a magnificent clothing house. I wanted it to appeal to anyone between 18 and 108. I mean, my, my 99 year old uncle, who's a veteran of World War II, US Marines, third division, Semper Fi, um, he enjoyed it and he's 99 or he, he read it when he was 98. And um, one of my nephews who was 14 read it and he liked it. So I just hope that um, the, the book, um, whoever reads it realizes that, uh, you know, there was a time when we, when Lincoln spoke about healing and compassion and kindness and to look at this as a symbol of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful message to leave us with. Well, Thank you for your time and thank you for My discussing pleasure. your book. And I implore everyone out there to pick this book up uh, and read it for yourself. Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you for joining us for this discussion with author Renette Chilton. I hope you learned something about Lincoln's great coat and the odyssey that it took. I also hope you'll join us next week as we're joined by author David J. Kent to discuss his new book, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius. Please consider picking up a copy of Lincoln's Great Coat, and as always, head to thecivilwarcenter.com for more. Have a great week.